Father, we thank you that the, the truth that we've been singing and testifying to is going to put our enemy in the pit and you're going to replace the curse with blessing. Thank you, you're doing that in our own lives. We were not only under the curse, we were part of it and hurt lots of people in our lifetimes. But thank you, you replaced that with the spirit of blessing and you put that well of living water down in our hearts and made us able to bless others. And what a miracle that is. And we pray that you'll finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. And we pray that nothing will hinder the climax of your work, Lord, in us and in the world, that we will consciously lay aside everything that's hindering us from finishing the race that you've called us to run. And thank you for your word today, and may it find its place in our understanding, Lord. Just ask for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> uh, just like to do a little checking at the beginning of this talk. How did you do with your fast this week? For those of you who weren't here, we were fasting from saying, I know. Unless you were to testify that you know the love of Jesus, you know his cleansing power, that was your juice and water. You could say, I know the work of Calvary is mine. And you could declare the truth of God, but this idea of saying, I know, needed to be fasted from. And did you inadvertently eat what you were intended to fast from? And <clears throat> I want to explain to you a little bit why that was important. Um, I believe the Lord is interested in us dropping from our inside world the idea that we've been insulted if somebody tells us something we already know there's way too much pride in that phrase I know, I know and I've seen it for months and months and months and I've heard it in my own voice and I realize how protective we are of ourselves what do you think I am, stupid? What do you think, I don't know? I know, I know. And it comes out so easily and quickly out of our mouths. And what it does is put the other person down. And Jesus never does that to me. Does he do that to you? When you tell him everything he needs to know? He doesn't come back and say, I know, I know, I know. There's something not right when we counter what people say with, I know. It's not right. It's hurtful. And... <clears throat> much better to say something powerful that you know, like, I do know the power of his cleansing blood. I do know that he loves me. I know that I'm being changed. I was not a nice person. Jesus has changed me, and I know his power to change my life. Instead of putting people off by saying, well, I know, I know, I know that. I won't say that I'm urging you to fast again this week. Forty days wouldn't be bad, though, to fast from us. You've had a seven-day fast, I hope. 
40 days wouldn't be too much, really. But I'm just going to leave it with the Lord and to convict me as well as you when we get into that state of mind where we're afraid that people might think that we're stupid. And we really don't know as much as we think we do. And especially when someone says to you about another person, and you go, I know. And are you sure? <laughs> Jesus is the only one that really knows. Is that true? Mm -hmm. He knows what makes us tick. So may Jesus help us to stay out of the spirit of I know. And secondly, I'm wondering if you were conscious of the difference this week between knowing the love of Jesus intellectually and actually experiencing it. We heard a wonderful talk last week. Pastor Alonzo was on fire last week. And that burned in me all week. If you're experiencing the love of Jesus, as he was talking about it last week, you not only um, were conscious of receiving Jesus' love by experience, and mostly through failure and weakness, but you were also conscious of giving it out, weren't you? What do you really have to give? Do people really need your intellectual ideas about Jesus' love? Is that what they need? Or do they need the actual love of Jesus through you? What do they really need? <clears throat> And I'm going to add just a little something to that. And I'll include myself. But we all talk way too much. We just talk too much. I'm not sure that everything I say is all that valuable. Sometimes we just like to hear the sound of our voices and we'd rather hear ourselves than anybody else. But Jesus doesn't talk all that much. People complain that they don't hear him speak, but he doesn't talk too much like we do. And I wonder if the Lord isn't going to slow us down a little bit I don't mean that you're not happy and merciful and interested in people, but sometimes well, in the multitude of words there lacketh not sin, Proverbs says. And sometimes we say too much and we get in trouble, don't we? A word spoken in season, Proverbs says, is like a pitcher of silver and a something of gold. What is it? An apple of gold or a pitcher of silver. Not a picture, a pitcher of silver holding beautiful water in a nice pitcher. My mother had a pitcher, silver pitcher. It's in, I think we still have it. It, it needs to be cleaned, it's tarnished. But I liked that pitcher when I was a kid. A word fitly spoken. Can we aim to have words that are fitly spoken this week? That are a blessing to people? Have you ever talked and noticed people trying to get away from you? Thank you for listening to that 
little introduction. Today I'm picking up somewhat on the theme of the talk two Sundays ago, which was follow me, speaking of Jesus, saying that to his disciples and taking them through the what I saw as three phases of that. Follow me at the beginning, calling the disciples at the beginning. And that was an abrupt and sudden following for some of them. They left their father in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. That's, that's amazing. So powerful was Jesus' invitation. They were willing to break family ties in one day. I won't go there again. But then the middle part where you get tested you know, in the middle. You have to let go of father, mother, houses, lands, brother, sister, and your own life also, somewhere in the middle. Because it says there in Luke 14, which I didn't emphasize two weeks ago, but it said great multitudes followed him. So he turned and said to them, if anyone wants to come after me, he has to hate his father, mother, brother, sister. And that needs a little explanation, but he had people following him and he thinned the crowd. Which is not the goal of most pastors to thin the crowd. And Jesus thinned the crowd. And there are several instances you can find in scripture where people were confronted in the middle of their following Jesus with, am I going to keep following? For example, in John 6, after Jesus explained about, I'm the bread of life. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it says they all left except for the 12. And he said, will you also go away? So they were faced with, are we going to keep following? Because we just saw the crowd disappear. That, that must have been difficult. Because people had run around the lake to find him after the miracle of loaves and fishes. They ran around the lake. Rabbi, how did you get over here? He never answered them. And that was, you know, that was TV fair because he could have told them, well, sit down here. I'm going to tell you how we got across the lake last night. Bring the cameras, bring the newspaper reporters. I'm going to tell you how I got across the lake with the disciples last night. <laughs> he never did that. He just said, and the reason you seek me is because you ate the loaves and fishes and were filled. So don't labor for the food that perishes. And that went on. And by the time he got through, they all left. I wonder what the 12 disciples thought. They had a crowd, and Jesus spoiled it. That's not how you get a good offering. And Demas was working with Paul, and then Paul says, Demas, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So there comes in the middle of your following Jesus a choice whether you're going to stay mm -hmm. with him or not. And then we look briefly at the end in John 21 where Jesus told Peter he was going to die. This he said, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And Peter was so squeamish over that. He turned and said, well, what about him, John? You know, what about him? He just he couldn't take the heat of that statement. And Jesus said to him, what is that to you? Follow me. And at the close of all this, we follow him to death. Do you like that? What if the Lord prophesied to you this morning, one of you, the Lord just descended on one of us and we came and laid hands on you and said, within three years you will be a martyr for the sake of the gospel. You're going to die a horrible death by torture. Yeah. 
Not what you do. <coughs> and the Lord made it somewhat real to me last week. I'm going to die. I don't know how. I'm not predicting I'm going to disappear. No, don't. <laughs> I don't know. We're all going to die anyway. Might as well die a martyr, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making fun of that. Did any of you see Dickie Brogdon's letter this week? Land of dying. He's back in Cairo. He's thinking about death. Dickie writes the most interesting letters, doesn't he? And he says, uh, I'm not afraid of death. It's the dying I'm afraid about, afraid of. And he starts to describe the various ways that he wouldn't want to die. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's a very good letter. But are you going to follow Jesus no matter what happens to you? Have you made that decision in your heart? Jesus said, follow me. And he told Peter, you're going to die this way. You, people are going to carry you where you don't want to go, and somebody's going to dress you and take care of you. When you were young, you took care of yourself. When you get old, you're not going to be able to. This he spake, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And Peter's agitated. Jesus said, what's that to you? Follow thou me. I wonder if you've made that commitment in your heart. You're going to follow him no matter what. John Collins, about whom I'm going to speak in a little bit, at length, <laughs> their wife, his wife, Violet, she's, she, if she were here, she wouldn't mind my saying this. She really wouldn't. He said to me, Violet thinks every ending is a fairy tale ending. They always fall in love and ride off into the sunset and everything's <laughs> wonderful. And I keep telling her, Violet, life is not like that. <laughs> There aren't always happy endings. <laughs> we all like happy endings, don't we? I made reference to a book that I read when we were in Florida. I never told the young people what actually happened. I don't know that any of you picked it up. It's back on the shelf. It's called The River God Forgot. And then the actual title is Sent to the River, God for God. And there's a couple who dedicated, about the same time Millie and I entered the ministry, to work for uh, Wycliffe translators. And they went to a very difficult and remote tribe in South America and uh, spent 17 years living with those people, raising their children, and translating the Bible into their own language, the New Testament, worked, 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 struggled, everything. Finally got it done. They went away to have it published, and they came back ready for this tremendous reception that they were going to get from the people. And a lot of people had gotten saved through their lives. And when they came back, the whole village, the whole tribe, had been corrupted by drug people that came in and had them wealthy from drug money, and they didn't want the New Testament that he spent 17 years translating. You talk about a blow. And yet, they're not bitter. That's a hard book to read. I'm glad I read it. Not everything turns out the way you hope. But if the command is to follow Jesus, you've got to follow him right straight through no matter what happens, right? Mm -hmm. I know this isn't popular. I, I don't mean to sound heavy. To me, it's wonderful to give your life for Jesus. Why not? Right? But... Sometimes you have to go through stuff. 
doesn't always turn out the way you hoped. But Jesus is there at the end of the road. There he is. And I suspect when we get there and see him, we'll understand better that whatever we did for him has eternal value. But whatever we did for self is rotted away. Well, that's way too long of an introduction, especially now. But someone said to me after the service two weeks ago, Doug, Pastor Doug, you only preach half that sermon. All of your examples of following Jesus were of people who went into full-time ministry. What about those of us who don't go into full-time ministry? And today I'm going to attempt to make up for that lack because it's in abundantly clear from Scripture that every single Christian is meant to follow Jesus, whether that means full-time ministry or not. <coughs> I could say a lot about that. <coughs> There's no question that Jesus lacks laborers. He said so. The harvest is plenteous, the laborers are few. So it's quite proper that we should be eager for any of you to go into full-time ministry. All right? But of course, many don't and aren't called to it. So what I'm after this morning is the other half of that sermon, follow me. And the subtitle is The Power of Example. The Power of Example. My text would be Philippians 3.17. Brethren, this is from the New King James. Philippians 3.17. Brethren, Join in following my example. And though, note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Was Paul saying they should all become apostles? Or prophets? Or evangelists? Or pastors? Or teachers? Obviously not. What was he talking about then? Follow me. Join in following my example. They were called, in the Greek implies, imitate me. Imitate me. But they were to imitate Paul in what he was saying in Philippians 2 and 3, which was his testimony. And this is conclusion that I'm making is very consistent with the other remarks that Paul made about himself as being an example, being an example to the believers. Later on in chapter 4, verse 9, Paul says to them, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Ooh. He's not talking about full-time, what we call full-time Christian service. In the, to the Corinthians, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 6, wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. In chapter 11 of that same book, he says, verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And we have this command in Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. This matter of following Jesus is not restrictive to only those that are going off to the mission field or into full-time ministry. It's for everyone. And Paul made himself an illustration of that fact and urged everyone who read his letters to follow him as he followed Christ. 
power, the power of example. Now, it so turns out that in 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 11, Paul expounds on that. Paul makes it clear exactly what he's talking about. And he says to Timothy, you have fully known, and then he makes a list of things. And this is what I'm after now with all of us. This is what it's going to mean for you to follow Jesus as a member of this congregation, whether you're in full-time ministry or not. You have fully known my doctrine. You follow Jesus in your doctrine. My manner of life, the way I lived, you saw it. In Thessalonians, he emphasizes that. You saw what I was like among them. I was like a nurse who cherishes the children under her care. My purpose, you fully know, Timothy, my purpose for living, what I do. My faith, the fourth one. My long-suffering, following Jesus, means you have lots of patience. My charity, then he uses the other New Testament word for patience. There's two of them. He uses both of them in this list. My persecutions and my afflictions. Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is that the pathway you're following? Not, are you going to go to the mission field? That may be included. But nobody in the congregation is excluded from following Jesus and from following somebody like Paul who said, I'm, you, you do what I did. The power of example. You do what I did. You saw it. You're not exempt from that. You follow me as I follow Christ. I gave you an example. I showed you what it's like to be a follower of Christ. Now do that. And that was to his congregation. Plural, congregations, many of them. The things that Paul listed right there in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11, don't consider even one example of his ministry. It's all about his character his life, the example he left. Now I'm going to take a little time to round this out by talking about my deceased friend, John Collins. And here's why. When John finished his service in World War II, and he had become a pilot, and he'd been over in the uh, Far East and in the Philippines, and he and his war buddies met together until his death every couple of years. He said, Doug, I would trust those men more than I trust most Christians. Because we, we gave our lives for each other. We would have died for each other. We had a comradeship that was very, very deep. But when he finished World War II and was dismissed, he went to Bible college. He married Violet first. And then he came back, uh, I mean, having come home, he married her, and then he decided, I'm called to the ministry. So he went to Bible college, and he finished Bible college, and he decided he would offer himself to the Assemblies of God as a missionary, and they turned him down and said no. Why? I don't know. So he had to make a living for his family, and he took a job. He got interested in IBMs, International Business Machines. Right at that time, IBM was the, at the top of the game, and they had um, conceived the leader, Thomas Watson, 
whose daughter I went to school with, they never sold anything. You could only lease computers from them and office equipment. It was an instant money maker. IBM made so much money and got so big because you couldn't buy anything from them. You had to lease it. So they knew what their income was every month. And John worked for them, got interested, and became good at data processing. And <coughs> he worked for Union Tank Car Company down in town Chicago and was my Sunday school teacher, and a good one, and a faithful one, and an example to me. My father was not a godly man, but John took an interest in me, and I remember when I got my license, he said, Doug, I want you to come down to Chicago. Now you can drive, and I'll tell you where to park, and you come to my office on the 17th floor of the Union Tank Car Company, and I'll take you to lunch. And I was pretty happy because nobody had treated me like that before. Took me to, um, what was it called? Uh, uh, started with a B, what was that restaurant? Berghoff's in downtown Chicago. It was a legend. And he kept that up. And then after a little while, he decided, oh, I really need to get in the ministry. That's my calling. So he went back to the Assemblies of God and said, I'm ready. Send me to Africa, wherever. He felt he had a call to Africa. And uh, by that time, he had four children. And they said, no, you've got too many children. <laughs> Another disappointment. And then unexpectedly, in their 40s, Violet was expecting again, and he called me and he said, you can't believe it, we're having twins. <laughs> and their last two children were twins in their 40s. <laughs> now he's really got too many children. He's never going to make it to the mission field. <laughs> but he did, got, he got a license from the Assemblies of God. They made him a licensed minister and they let him fill in occasionally and he worked on the platform with the minister at the church where he was and that's where I met John. He was, in those days, they had like a worship leader, not a worship team, but one person would lead the singing and help the people worship and then turn it over to the pastor. And John did that and he did it very well. And. Uh, that's when I really got to know him. And, uh, so as time went on, <clears throat> it became obvious that John isn't going to get to the mission field as his career. It's not going to happen. And it was a bitter pill for him to swallow. He wanted to go on the mission field badly. And the Lord used him to reach different people for Christ. Lots of people got saved through his ministry as a businessman and a father and a husband. And lots of people got healed. There were a number of people that needed healings. Two of them I know of at least that had cancer that were healed through John's prayers. And he was a blessing to many people. But as he continued to seek the Lord, and that's part of the example that got me, was John always sought the Lord. It didn't matter if he was a businessman. It didn't matter that he had six children and a family to take care of. He always sought the Lord privately. And one day in that seeking, the desire came over him. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I will never be happy until I'm like Jesus. And his verse, which I preached at his funeral, was, I will be satisfied. As for me, I will be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And he said, Doug, that desire came over me so strongly that I asked the Lord to take it away or I would have died right then and there. I was consumed with a passion to be like Jesus.
Jesus. A businessman, a father of six children, working in the church where he could, teaching Sunday school, leading worship, filling in occasionally to speak in a church or two. And as soon as he did that, the bottom fell out of his life. Four of his six children have diabetes. Severe. One of them died recently in a diabetic seizure. His oldest one. He lost his job. He had a wonderful job by that time with Beatrice Foods. You're going to be here a little longer than usual, so just relax, all right? He had a wonderful job with Beatrice Foods. Beatrice Foods was one of the biggest conglomerates in Chicago. They had 120 companies. They had the big sign that you see from, uh, even, I mean, uh, the express, uh, Kennedy Expressway. Uh, just before you reach the loop, they had a great big sign there advertising Beatrice Foods, and John was the head of data processing for them. He had a wonderful job. He'd been in, um, he used to tell me, I've been in walnut-covered boardrooms all over Europe and in America with the most impressive CEOs, and he lost his job. And in the process, he didn't want his children to worry, so he'd dress up in a suit and tie and go out in the morning as though we were going to work, but he was pounding the pavement, trying to find work, and ended up in the unemployment line in Skokie. One of the most humiliating things he ever went through. From boardrooms, corporate boardrooms, to waiting in line to sign up for unemployment. I'm talking about following Jesus and the power of an example. All right? And <clears throat> then he was going to a church, not the one that he had gone to much later, but in this church he was suspicious that something was wrong in the leadership of the church. I visited that church with him, and I too shared something's wrong in this church. And as he was praying, the Lord said, a man is going to give a message in tongues this, mor uh, this Sunday morning, and you're going to interpret it. And this is the interpretation. And the interpretation included the statement, the body is sick because the head is sick. And it happened, just like that. A man gave a message in tongues in the middle of the service, and John interpreted, and the pastor took offense. Oh, my. And instead of getting the plain, obvious meaning out of that, he called a board meeting and had John put on trial for heresy, saying that the body of Christ was sick because Jesus was sick. Anybody that knows John, that <laughs> thought would never have entered John's mind, ever. And the pastor put him on trial and the board agreed with the pastor, and they excommunicated John from the church and told him he couldn't come anymore. He's not a member and not wanted. There's more to that story, which I won't go into now. But that was hard. And then John had gotten involved with an insurance company, finally, had gotten a job with an insurance company, and the leader of the insurance company was a Christian, supposedly. Um, but that president of that company and John went to the Continental Bank in downtown Chicago to get a loan for the company. And sitting in that boardroom with the bank board 
And that, if you've ever been to that building, it looks like a Greek temple. It's a temple to mammon, if there ever was one. I've been there. And to his horror, he saw the, and heard the president of this company that he was working for presented a financial picture to the board that was untrue in order to look favorable so the board would uh, approve the loan. And John knew the truth. So they went out in the hall afterwards, and John just couldn't take it. And he said to his boss, I need to go back in there for a minute. And he went back in. They were still sitting around the table. Oh, what would you like? He said, gentlemen, I cannot live with myself if I don't tell you that what you just heard is not the truth. My boss has misrepresented the financial condition of our church, uh, I mean of our company, and I cannot be part of that deception. They thanked him. The loan was not granted, it was denied, and his boss eventually found out why. And eventually started a rumor that in Springfield, Illinois, which was where the uh, insurance company was headquartered, uh, that John was running a call girl ring in Springfield, Illinois. <laughs> You'd think they could have found a more believable lie, you know, than that, but anyway. And Violet was ready to talk to any radio or TV station that would interview her <laughs> and any newspaper that would print the truth. And he wouldn't, and he wouldn't let her. He said, no, God will defend me. If I try to defend myself, it won't be right. Oh, that was hard. I know I have to bring this to a close. Many other things happened that were examples to me, tremendous examples to me. John was generous to a fault. I received so much of help from John. That beautiful desk and credenza I have in my office at home. He just simply drove me to the place and said, pick what you want, I'm gonna pay for it, you need this. When I landscaped my lawn, I worked one whole summer in the back there when that was all trees, and I took out 18 trees, and I rented a tractor, and I worked myself to the bone. <sighs> and I just couldn't do it. It's too many of those huge Menards old used railroad timbers that weigh about 300 pounds each, and I'm dragging them around the yard and trying to do that, and John said to me, what are you doing? And he said, hire a landscaper. And he paid $4,000 for my back area to be landscaped. Nobody knew. $4,000. And it wasn't only me he was generous to us. He once took me to supper when I was at Pure Life alone preaching. Millie wasn't with me that time. He said, Doug, let's go out for supper in Cincinnati. I'll take you to a really nice restaurant, which he did numerous times. Never once would he let me pay the bill for any meal we ever ate together. A businessman, though. And we went there, and it was the kind of restaurant where you don't park your own car. The valet, valet comes out and parks your car for you. So the man, the boy comes out, and John says, here, gives him a nice tip. The guy goes off with the car and parks it. And we ate a wonderful meal, and we came out to get the car, and he handed the ticket to the boy, and the boy brought the car up, and he handed him another tip. I said, John, 
You already tipped him. He said, I know. I know. I said to him, why? And he used to leave tips for waitresses that would leave their mouths hanging open. I said, why do you do that? He said, because I might have to witness to them sometime and share the gospel with them. And if I'm chip, cheap and chintzy, they won't listen to me. I personally delivered hundreds of turkeys to his employees through the year when he finally owned his own business, gratis to all his employees. He always gave them a, Christmas, a, a Thanksgiving turkey and a Christmas ham. I helped him. I drove from Zion down to Chicago to help him carry those turkeys and hams into his office and deliver them with a smile to all his employees. His father was an example. He said, my father only slapped me in the face once. He said, at the table. I was early teens. And my mother asked me to do something, and I sassed her. And my father reached over and whacked me in the face so hard. And he said, if you don't respect her because she's your mother, you will respect her because she's my wife. And he said, I never sassed my mother again, ever. <laughs> And he told me my father was the godliest man I ever knew. I didn't have a godly father. But John, God put in my life so I could see what a godly father was like. And his life influenced my life tremendously. And toward the end of his life, as many of you know, the opportunity opened up for him to teach a whole semester at Kaimosi Bible College in Africa. And he, as he, we took him to the airport. Violet was sick, remember that? Could hardly get there. And we took him to the airport. He was happy as a lark. And he said to me, at last, I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary. <laughs> he actually went twice. And he also went to Russia twice as a missionary at the end of his life. I could tell many more things. I felt I should just lay it out to you today because he never was in full-time ministry except for those little trips toward the end of his life to Africa. But his example... I followed because I knew he was following Christ. And he taught me not only by precept, but by example. And I could go on till 3 o'clock talking about the examples I had in the faith homes of ministers who not only taught us but we lived with them. All right, now there's two sides to applying this. One application is you have a right to see whether your leaders here at Evergreen uh, have the right to ask you to follow us. You have a right to ask and look.
That's an awesome responsibility. So, you can say, Jesus, should I follow them as they follow Christ? You have a right to say that. But secondly, what about you? Is your conduct as a member of Evergreen Center, and we don't have a membership role, but you come here, is your conduct exemplary? Do these young people that you see come year after year, uh, do you want the young people to imitate you? Are you confident enough to say to the young people that come here, follow me as I follow Christ? Not because you're in full-time ministry. Not because you, you're like Frankie or Brian or something like that. You know. I, had to, I had to answer this lack in my last sermon. But following you because you have these qualities that Paul had in his life so that he could say, follow me as I follow Christ. Do you have them? Are you comfortable saying to our young people, follow me as I follow Christ? I have a quote to read from Thomas Sowell. I've referred to him different times. He just wrote this. He gave an, an analogy, wrote a beautiful analogy in the LA Times about a woman who got caught in a blinding snowstorm on her way home and couldn't find east, west, north, south and went around trying to find her house in this blinding snowstorm and never found it and died 50 yards from her door. And he says, unlike the lady lost in the snowstorm, who might with better luck have stumbled into her home, many young people today do not seem to know the way, but they have many other people leading them off in other directions. This is not a minister, this is a columnist. Some of these other people are fellow youngsters with little experience or understanding of a wider world than the one they grew up in, and a short time horizon that seldom extends beyond the pleasures and the excitement of the moment. Their shared ignorance might seem like knowledge, and by the time experience in the world of hard knocks gives them some real knowledge, it may be too late. There's no father in the home sometimes. And too often this is the case. And adolescent boys choose as models irresponsible people in the world of entertainment or even in the world of crime. And then there are messiahs with a message. The most popular message that these people speak seems to be that all your problems are due to other people. People that the messiahs will help fight in exchange for your loyalty, your money, or your votes. What would be an analogy of the lady in a snowstorm would be if she had someone leading her in the opposite direction of her home. And there are some well-intentioned people, he says, who imagine they're helping when in fact they're doing more harm than good. Some people think they're doing young people a favor to promote the idea that their problems are caused by other people rather than by knowledge and skills that they lack if they, and could acquire if they put their minds to it and stayed with it. And some of the well-meaning people think that promoting young people's self-esteem and being non-judgmental is the way to go. Some even make excuses for them either 
openly or indirectly, by using such word as such words as they're troubled youth or they're at risk young people. They do this even when the youths are trouble for others and a risk for those who encounter them but are having a great time themselves raising hell. Why did I read that? Because you have the power to influence young people by your example, whether you're called into the full-time ministry or not. Are you up to the call? Follow me? No matter where it takes you? You're willing to embrace that? I can't thank Brother John Collin enough for following Jesus as a businessman. What about you? Thank you for that word to our hearts this morning. That we all have a call to follow you. That you might re be revealed in each of us. That we might touch lives around us, no matter where we are, Lord. No matter if we're at the workplace or at home with our neighbors, at school. Everywhere we go, Lord, you have called us to reflect you that others might see and others might know that you live. So, Lord, I pray that that word would just winnow itself deep into our hearts this week, Lord, that we have a responsibility, a duty, an obligation to serve you no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter how insignificant we may think it is, it's significant, Lord, because you're at work in us. And you have called us, O oh God, to be a blessing to those around us. And that we'll do that if we'll follow you. Go with each one this week, Lord. Bless them immensely. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed.